But let's find out what uh, was going on during the Enlightenment. Let's start with, um, with Darren McMahon, who uh, is a professor of history at Florida State and has got a couple of books out. One's about the Enlightenment, but he also has a nice big book out at the moment on happiness. Um, but I asked Darren what he wanted to start with, and he's given it the title, Does the Enlightenment Need an Upgrade? So, Darren McMahon. here. Uh, you know, there are times when you start to feel good about yourself and then you open a program up like uh, today's and you start looking at the people on the list and I thought, my God, I'm 42 years old and I have yet to be the director of the Max Planck Institute. What am I doing? So uh, <coughs> this will be a spur. Uh, a couple of, uh, of the token humanists uh, were, were walking over to the building this morning and, and a young woman came up and said, beyond belief? <laughs> Not beyond hope, but uh, beyond belief. Well, uh, Roger left this very uh, open-ended. He asked that, uh, uh, you know, I do two things, essentially. He said, you know, it would be a good idea to be funny, uh, and presumably not unintentionally so. Uh, and then he said, would you throw a bomb? And uh, I thought about that for a little while, and I, and I basically admitted to myself that I'm not really a, a bomb-throwing uh, type of thinker. I, I'm not comfortable throwing rocks or using uh, incendiary devices, but that I didn't really need to. Uh, because this morning I uh, wanted to talk about the Enlightenment, what we might call Enlightenment 1.0, uh, and that the Enlightenment can usually be counted upon to uh, generate fireworks and, and explosions. I'm reminded of that, uh, that, that first Macintosh operating system. Some of you remember that when uh, there was a, a system failure, a little bomb came up with a, with a burning fuse and says that, sorry, a system error has occurred. And I, 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 I guess that uh, my job here today is to um, talk a little bit uh, as a historian along with uh, Professor Jacob about what Enlightenment uh, 1.0 was and whether it does need an upgrade, whether the bomb that tends to appear on the screen is internal to the system or external, uh, the result of error or uh, something, something else. Well, what exactly the Enlightenment was uh, is, as uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, an old question. Uh, it's at least as old uh, as 1784 when Immanuel Kant uh, posed his famous question, the Berlinische Monatschrift, uh, was ist Aufklärung? Uh, but I would argue, in fact, it long precedes it and it certainly uh, goes uh, well after both proponents and opponents of the movement uh, have been asking the question, what is this thing uh, for a long, long time? And I think that's only fitting in that <clears throat> whatever else the Enlightenment may have been, uh, it was certainly bound up with the art of, of posing questions. Uh, Emma Rothschilds uh, reminds us uh, uh, that the Enlightenment was a, quote, discursive, disputatious, theorizing way of life, and that's something of a, a scholarly mouthful, uh, but I think it gets it right. The Enlightenment was uh, more concerned, really, with asking pointed questions than with providing hard and fast answers, although it certainly didn't shy away from providing answers when it needed to. Enlightenment relished, in other words, discussion. Uh, it relished questioning. It relishes getting into arguments, uh, and it's done so from the very beginning. Um, some might say that the Enlightenment relished throwing bombs. And so I just want to talk about uh, some of the explosions uh, it has set off or, or been said uh, to set off uh, by way of, uh, of bringing us up to, to the present. And I, I want to start by reading to you uh, a passage from a French priest, uh, a man by the name of Charles uh, Louis Richard, who was writing at the end of the old regime uh, in the 1780s, about five years before the outbreak uh, of the French Revolution in a work he entitled The Exposition uh, de la Doctrine des Philosophes Modernes, The Exposition of, of, modern, uh, of the Modern philosoph uh, Philosophers. Uh, oh, it's a work about what we would call uh, the Enlightenment. And here's what he says. Everywhere philosophy, modern philosophy, and he's referring to people like Diderot and Dalaubert and, uh, and, and Voltaire. Everywhere philosophy lights the torch of discord and of war, prepares poisons, sharpens swords, lays fires, orders murder, massacre, and carnage, sacrifices fathers by the hands of sons and sons by the hands of fathers, 
It directs lances and swords at the heads and the breasts of sovereigns, placing them on scaffolds, which it yearns to see flowing with sovereigns' blood, blood that it will drink in deep draughts as it feasts its eyes on the horrible specter of their torn, mutilated, and bloody members. Now, in Richard's view, uh, and, and, and Professor Jacob and I could, could cite to you a great many passages uh, just like this uh, uh, from across Europe and, and indeed uh, from the New World uh, in, in just this vein. Uh, in, in Richard's view, the long fuse of the Enlightenment was preparing devastation of precisely this sort. Uh, the overturning of altars, regicide, parricide, uh, social anarchy and breakdown, uh, sexual license and dissolution, uh, terror and civil war, followed by despotism and tyranny of a sort never before seen. And while you might be inclined to dismiss this rhetoric uh, as, a, as so much nonsense and, and, and paranoid rant, and of course uh, on some level that's precisely what it was, you also have to keep in mind nonetheless that all the things that Richard and his brethren imagined in their frenzied apocalyptic nightmares in the 50 or so years before uh, 1789 actually came to pass in the upheaval uh, of the French Revolution and, and the subsequent wars, kings were killed. The church was destroyed, or at least uh, the revolutionaries attempted to do so. Altars were pillaged. Sons were turned against fathers and fathers against sons. The patriarchal, hierarchical order of society was challenged. Jews and Protestants and atheists were allowed to vote and write alongside uh, good Christian men and women. France was subsumed by civil war, and Europe was drowned in rivers of blood that culminated in the great dictatorship of Napoleon. Now this was not, to be sure, uh, as Richard and others would later allege, because of a formal conspiracy or plot. And uh, Timothy Dwight, then president of Yale College, delivers a sermon to the undergraduates in 1797, warning them uh, that the plot that had led to the French Revolution was at foot in the United States, and we must fight the Enlightenment uh, here before it uh, lead to similar outcomes. <coughs> uh, Clearly, uh, this was not a, a, a plot, and yet the terrible destruction of the French Revolution and the subsequent European-wide wars happened all the same, and that fact gave uh, the likes of Richard uh, a certain real credibility uh, in the aftermath of, of the terror. Had they not predicted the apocalypse? Had they not warned that the Enlightenment led to chaos and destruction, that the Enlightenment was a bomb? Well, that claim, however reductive and however stilted, carried considerable rhetorical force. And so it really shouldn't surprise us that it stayed around for an awful long time, uh, finding its way into the thought of uh, uh, far more subtle thinkers than Richard, uh, people uh, uh, of the stamp of Burke, uh, even Tocqueville, and Ten in the 19th century and then uh, thereafter uh, for some time. <coughs> It's revealing uh, and, and, and also somewhat amusing that the very first definition of the Enlightenment uh, as a movement and a period, and people don't refer to the Enlightenment as a, as a time uh, in Western history really until the end of the 19th century, at least in English and German. Hegel's doing it at the beginning of the 19th. Uh, the first definition in the Oxford uh, English Dictionary uh, appears in 1891, uh, and it's a negative one. Here's, here it is, uh, Enlightenment noun, sometimes used uh, after the German Aufklärung or Aufklärerei, to designate the spirit or names of the French philosophers of the 18th century or of others whom it is intended to associate with them in the implied charge, and this is the good part, of shallow and pretentious intellectualism, unreasonable contempt for tradition and authority, etc. <clears throat> if you go online and you look at the third edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, that, that definition is still up, uh, which is uh, very amu amusing and I think also telling. Because so powerful was this received set of associations between enlightenment on the one hand uh, and abstract theory, social license, atheism, and, and revolutionary despotism on the other that it shows up even in the writings and thinking uh, of those inclined to see the century of lights with a good deal of sympathy. Uh, take Sir Isaiah Berlin, for example, uh, a great defender uh, of liberty and, and someone who could look upon the enlightenment era as, quote, one of the best and most hopeful episodes in the life of mankind. And yet Berlin nonetheless can comment that, quote, the great 18th century philosophers, by whom he means primarily French philosophers, were ultimately responsible for a lot of intellectual tyranny ending in the Soviet Union in the Gulag. 
I have a, I have a graduate student right now uh, who's, who's doing a dissertation on how the Enlightenment uh, gets swept up and historicized, historicized during the, the debates of the Cold War in the 1940s and 1950s, and it's, it's clear that it's joined almost immediately to the critique and analysis of totalitarianism uh, that people like Karl Popper and Hannah Arendt and Jacob Talman and others are, are working out in, in the 40s and 50s. Um, and, and you get the further kind of confirmation uh, or further assertion of the view that the Enlightenment lay not only behind the uh, alleged tyranny of reason that was the uh, French Revolution, uh, but also behind the Bolshevik uh, Revolution of 1917. Uh, it is, as I say, really a, a quite a common, common charge. And of course, it, it wasn't just those who took a vi dim view of the French or Russian revolutions uh, who were inclined to malign the Enlightenment, uh, but those on the self-conscious left as well. For doctrinaire Marxists, uh, the Enlightenment was, predictably enough, uh, simply ideological cover for the hegemony uh, of the bourgeoisie. And for Marxists of the Western variety, the kinder, softer uh, uh, folks like Max Horkheimer and, and Theodore Adorno, the Enlightenment lay behind fascism and the Shoah, uh, the infamous, uh, perverse, and in my view, ultimately rather silly argument of their dialectic uh, of the Enlightenment of 1944 which begins with Odysseus and the Greeks and ends with disaster triumphant. Enlightenment is apparently uh, the better part of Western civilization, and enlightenment, we are told in a famous line, behaves towards things uh, as a dictator toward men. The enlightenment is totalitarian. The movement that aimed at liberating men and women from fear and establishing their sovereignty at disenchanting the world instead objectified nature and ended uh, and enslaved humanity in a modern myth of the hegemony of reason. Now it's true that uh, a little bit like Foucault in this regard, who was so critical of the Enlightenment and at the same time attracted to it and by it, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer had planned to write a sequel uh, to the Dialectic of Enlightenment entitled Die Rettung der Aufklärung, or the uh, Rescue of the Enlightenment, uh, but they unfortunately never got around to it. And, and, and that reminds me a little bit of, of Innocent III's uh, infamous Contemptus Mundi uh, from the early 13th century, The Misery of the Human Condition, in which he you know, chronicles how awful we all are. Alive we bring forth lice and tapeworms, and dead we beget worms and flies and dung and stench, and goes on. In, 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 that, uh, in that vein, uh, Innocent too had planned to follow the work with another that, quote, exalted man, uh, but he never got around to it. Uh, <coughs> and I think the order of the undertaking is, is telling. It's also telling that in many of these same charges, uh, that the Enlightenment was totalitarian, intolerant, responsible for the greatest ills of modernity, uh, was responsible for imperialism, racism, misogyny, environmental destruction, that many of these charges have turned up uh, again and again in a good deal of, of postmodern uh, criticism of the Enlightenment. And I'm not going to uh, dwell on that here, uh, but only to point out uh, the strange irony that I develop uh, at some length elsewhere, that the postmodern rhetoric against the Enlightenment sounds very much like the Catholic reactionaries I, I talked about at the beginning. The, the similarities are really quite striking. And in a person like Carl Schmitt, uh, who, as you know, was the uh, chief uh, legal theorist for the Nazis and an heir to this Catholic uh, uh, reactionary tradition in the 19th century, uh, uh, you s the, the recent postmodern left's interest in him, uh, uh, I, I think, is you know, telling in this regard as well. Well, you've gleaned by now that uh, uh, my own view is that any movement can enrage both right-wing Catholic reactionaries and, and, and the postmodern left must have something going for it. Uh, <clears throat> but before I give my two cheers for enlightenment, uh, let me make one other important point, and that is that despite all the shoddy history and, and, and silly causal claims of the various enemies of enlightenment I've, I've referred to just now, they do in the end have at least one point worth heeding. And that is that the Enlightenment was disruptive. It was challenging. Indeed, it was revolutionary. Professor uh, Jacob uh, has described uh, the Enlightenment as a great cultural upheaval, similar in scale and scope to the Reformation. Jonathan Israel, uh, also a staunch defender of the Enlightenment or the radical Enlightenment, has likewise insisted recently on the, the Enlightenment's revolutionary character. And I think we need to take these claims seriously. For although a great deal of recent scholarship um, has insisted on the Enlightenment's moderation in many of its guises, on its compatibility with religion, uh, on its political conservatism even, and uh, somebody like uh, Gertrude uh, Himmelfarb uh, has gone so far in a recent, uh, uh, and not very, in my view, successful book, The Roads to Modernity, uh, 
to argue that not only was the Enlightenment compatible with John Wesley's Mormonism, uh, Methodism in the 18th century, but that a modern Methodist, and I'm not making this up, George W. Bush is the shining modern example of the best of the British and American Enlightenment. <laughs> My apologies to our British colleagues. Uh, the problem with this type of interpretation and uh, uh, their, their problems, there's of course a, a good deal of very good work uh, that emphasizes the moderate character on the Enlightenment. But the problem I would argue uh, with, with much of it is that it causes us to forget just how radical were and indeed are uh, many uh, uh, of the values uh, and mindset standing behind Enlightenment. The disposition to live without fear in what might well be a fatherless world. The disposition to chart our own course and our own ends uh, for ourselves. The disposition to subject even our most cherished assumptions to constant criticism and investigation, to take nothing uh, on faith. And those are challenging injunctions. And the package of values that grew out of their sustained application in the 17th and 18th centuries the adoption of mathematical and historical reason as the sole criterion of truth, the rejection of supernatural agency, magic, disembodied spirits, divine providence and, uh, of any kind, a defense of the equality of all humanity, uh, including racial and sexual equality, the belief in a secular universalism and ethics based on equity, justice, and charity, the vindication of freedom of expression, the adoption of democratic republicanism as the most legitimate form of political organization, personal liberty of lifestyle and sexual and other matters, and comprehensive toleration and freedom of thought based on independent critical thinking, that this package of values, like the disposition that underlies them, is threatening, unsettling, difficult, frightening to those who've not yet emerged from their own imposed or self-imposed immaturity. And this is something that we need to keep very much in mind, I would argue, as we look at the world today. For the fact remains, as, as Jonathan Israel insists, that the universal revolution in ideas, education, culture, social theory, and political reality postulated by the radical thinkers of the Enlightenment was nowhere ever fully carried through and remains today incomplete, not least in the United States, whatever Professor Himmelfarb might say. And so I would be inclined to argue that the Enlightenment doesn't need an upgrade, that we should work rather to fully implement the one we've got. And at the same time that we should remind ourselves and be reminded, particularly when we look at uh, parts of the world today that are only just beginning this process, that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be messy, in fact, that it's going to be difficult, and it's going to be, as my friend uh, Mark Lilla has argued in his recent book, The Stillborn God, which Rebecca uh, reviewed so sharply in, in the Times, that in many respects, enlightenment and the process of enlightenment, with all the uncertainties and open-endedness and messiness that it entails, is in many ways uh, not our default position as human beings. We have to work for it, work continually, and work hard. And on that note, uh, let me just end by uh, citing a passage to you from, from one of my teachers, uh, Peter Gay. Uh, whose two-volume National Book Award winning The Enlightenment Interpretation uh, is usually today sort of trotted out as an example of uh, you know, the kind of uh, old uh, high intellectual history that uh, uh, we should avoid. Uh, it, it's considered as something a, as a relic. Uh, and yet, uh, I think most people would still agree that it's a wise and humane book in many respects. And let me just quote to you uh, from, from Professor Gay's uh, last lines. The world has not turned out the way the philosophes wished and half expected that it would. Old fanaticisms have been more intractable, irrational forces more inventive than the philosophes were ready to conjecture in their darkest moments. Problems of race, of class, of nationalism, of boredom and despair in the midst of plenty have emerged almost in defiance of the philosophes' philosophy. We have known horrors that the men of the Enlightenment did not see in their worst nightmares. Yet, though few are inclined to believe it, none of this impairs the permanent value of the Enlightenment's humane and libertarian vision or the permanent value of its critical method any more than the philosophes' failure to live up to their own prescriptions or realize their own ideals compromises the worth of those same prescriptions and ideals. It remains as true today as it was in the 18th century. The world needs more light than it has, not less. And the cure for the shortcomings of enlightened thought lies not in obscurantism, but in further 
enlightenment. Thank you. And So thanks very much. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, what, I, what I thought we would do is get through a, two or three um, talks first and then have a little question and answer session at that point. Um, the, as you, I think that was wonderfully demonstrated that one of the reasons that, um, that we're talking about the Enlightenment at all is that um, we, we plan this to be a, an ongoing project to foster and promote the use of reason in formulating social policy. So it seemed to be a good idea to have a at least get some historical grounding in this, but you can see how, how the history is right there in the present. Um, there is a one, before I introduce Peg Jacob, there, there is a wonderful book um, called Humanity by Jonathan Glover, uh, Moral History of the 20th Century. And he, he, men he mentions in there that wonderful um, vision that um, Quine often used to quote as well from Otto von Neurath about science um, being like a boat and doing science is like trying to keep the boat afloat while you're replacing it plank by plank and staying afloat. Um, one of the things that comes up in my reading about Enlightenment is that there's this enormous confusion about what boat. I mean, not, people did not feel like they were in the same boat. And I, I would like to, that's one of the things I hope will, will come out of here because I'd like to actually end up with, um, on the end of day two, and, um, with some, some agenda, some thoughts about where we should go from here.